exactly. Very good. Okay, people are entering, but I do not want to delay the session. Uh, so let's start the session. So now morning we saw this report from the US and now we will have the report from the other part side of the Atlantic. Yeah, Eric, floor to you. Okay, so, uh, thank you very much um, for uh, invitation to this uh, meeting, which I think is a wonderful meeting uh, to Rohini and Swapan for organizing this, which uh, good for the connection of India to Europe and US in two ways, I think, and also very timely, given the strategy we heard this morning from, uh, from Snowmass and the European strategy, which is a bit more old news. Uh, but nevertheless, I think it's uh, good to uh, go over not just what it was recommended, but a bit the process behind it as well, and the mechanism, which gives an interesting uh, comparison of process between the US and Europe. Um, now, uh, I, was, I was not in charge of this process, but I was a participant. And I, in that sense, I, uh, as a council delegate for the Netherlands, I was also part of the strategy group. And, and so I can at least give you a bit of an inside view to some extent. So the goal is to give you a bit of background, go over the statements and roughly what has been done with those statements until now. That's sort of the plan for, uh, for the talk. Uh, so uh, it is the process, the, it's the, the strategy update process, only one strategy that gets updated every six, seven years. And it is the process by which the European particle physics community, um, uh, including CERN, but not only CERN, also the Europe-wide uh, and its member states determines its a strategy, not a vision, but right? it's a strategy. So there's really things to uh, prioritize and to uh, make a, a list of what you should do and what you should not do. It is a two-year process. Uh, it's a well-regulated process, uh, bottom-up, uh, maybe not quite to the extent that the SNOMED process is, but still, nevertheless, I'll show you roughly how. Uh, all stakeholders that can define themselves uh, can give input. And as I said, it's not just a nice document that you put in a drawer now and then when you wanna get inspiration, you look at, but actually it's a serious strategy um, for, for, for guidance of policy. And at least it's a good quote uh, generator that you see many quotes from the strategy are really you see in talks all over the place It also gave me the impression oh this is actually taken quite seriously as a theorist before i got involved in these things i wasn't that much aware of all of this but it's i've seen now how how it works and also it's it followed it's it's very impressive so but perhaps to understand a bit behind it it's good to remind you of how cern is governed um because uh, it has some bearing on this so um uh, the highest authority of CERN is the council, um, and it's uh, governed by a president and uh, there's various subcommittees. And what the uh, council does, it's responsible for all major decisions of the lab. So it approves large programs, adopts budgets, reviews expenditures, etc. cetera. Um, these committees are standing committees that get rejuvenated, of course, regularly. Uh, and, um, and those are also quite international. There are two representatives from the US and from Japan on this, for example. They're all ad personam, so there's not a representative function. Um, and the director general, of course, manages the lab to, together with the directorate. And formally, she is the secretary of the council. So that's the formal structure of, uh, uh, of the governance. And this is already enshrined in the uh, by now quite uh, venerable CERN convention. Uh, which was uh, uh, not just there to govern CERN, but it was very much, and these days as well to remember, uh, founded to enshrine science for peace. And it's something that is good to uh, be reminded of, particularly, as I said, in these days. So the council has 23 member states, so typically two delegates per member state. Uh, Serbia was the latest full new member, and has had votes on all these key decisions uh, uh, in, um, regarding CERN and gives guidance on many more. Uh, there were 10 associate member states, uh, among which India, since, 19, since 2016. Um, probably the, the next one might be Brazil. That would be the first one uh, on, the, on the American continent. So, uh, and these are the representatives from uh, India that are uh, 
representing India in the council. There are also observer states, Japan and the United States, the Russian Federation and Jinnah have been suspended for reasons that you all well know. It meets four times a year. Uh, it is all the council week. And this is an action-packed picture of, uh, of what the council does. Um, so, uh, CERN, some numbers. The annual budget of CERN is about 1.2 billion uh, Swiss francs. It's equivalent to a medium sized uh, uh, European university. Um, organization like a small city, there was lots of other services. There was hostels, there was a medical service, there was housing, there was all kinds of stuff. There's traffic you deal with. Um, and of course, the nice thing about CERN is that budget is more or less guaranteed. Right? It is not that you have to go to Congress every year and beg for the money or ask for the money, I should say. But uh, so that gives a lot of stability, and that also makes a, a difference in how things can be uh, strategized. The member states pay according to their uh, national gross national product. Associate members they typically pay about ten percent of what the full membership would cost. Uh, India is uh, involved in CMS, and Alice is very active in there. Uh, I think also in Isolde and also in the computing, which is very important support activity, of course, uh, and, and research activity by itself. But for many, for, for most purposes, CERN should be seen as an accelerator and user facility. The, ex the experiments are not CERN, right? They are their own collaborations with CERN also as a member. Uh, and are, those are paid for by, well, the members of the experiment through MOUs. Um, there's a lot of R&D going on, of course, at, uh, at CERN, accelerators, detectors, uh, but not only there, also in the various national institutes and labs, and that's important as well for the European model. So uh, this whole activity was started in 2005, where the CERN Council uh, acted as a council, not just for CERN, the lab, but also for European particle physics, as was already stated in the CERN convention, and the appropriate quote is uh, here. And uh, it also defined uh, this initiative, the update mechanism. Uh, and it was updated in 2013 and most recently in 2020. And uh, as I said, it's a guide for long-term decision-making in the field with priority setting. It is not resource loaded though. So every big decision will have, every big project or new thing will need to be separately voted on to uh, give it the budget. Um, so in 2006, the first strategy report came out, and there, uh, in a nutshell, the, uh, the first and foremost priority was LHC and prepare for the Hailumi LHC and do uh, R&D for click and neutrino facilities and, of course, other priorities as well. In 2013, uh, the recommendation was to exploit LHC to the fullest uh, and uh, also uh, get really ready for the Hailumi phase. Um, it was not formally approved then, but that happened shortly afterwards. And also carry out design studies for the next collider at CERN. Um, Europe looked forward to an ILC proposal from Japan that was, it was one of the high priorities and also develop a long baseline neutrino program with the US and Japan. So uh, now after this two year process, the next update was on Friday, the uh, 19th in June 2020, where the location was, was to be Budapest, but you know what happened. So it was an online uh, meeting where the unanimously all the member states uh, voted in favor of the, the update. And that became then the strategy. And this was the culmination of two years of a lot of compilation, discussion, and deliberation, et cetera. So uh, who was involved in this process? Well, uh, the main group is the European Strategy Group, um, which had one member per uh, member state. Uh, often it was the council delegate. So in Director General, nine lab directors formed the Laboratory Directors Group, five from observer states and chairs of the astroparticle physics, the nuclear physics, the funding agencies, and their infrastructure uh, organizations. The Secretariat, which did a lot of work and really guided the whole process. And also important was the Physics Preparatory Group, uh, which I'll come to in a moment, consisting of Scientific Policy Committee members, ECFA, et cetera, and also from two from Asia and two from the Americas, just to prepare the physics input for the strategy group to write the strategy. So the inputs were collected in the fall of 2018 with a call for contributions with a prescribed length, 10, 10 pages maximum. We received not as many as snow mass, but still a good number. Um, and they were divided in all kinds. There were, there were countries submitting the view from country X, from subfields, uh, from neighboring fields, et cetera, all were uh, so brought inputs to the strategy. 
And this is always an important step in reaching consensus to make sure everyone feels involved. Um, besides the uh, uh, with inputs also, and, these, and these groups, also six working groups were formed on specific topics, social and career, as for the next generation, global projects, relations with other groups, knowledge transfer, public engagement and sustainability. And all of these wrote a separate report as well. Um, so after that, uh, already mentioned uh, uh, earlier was an open symposium in May 2019 in Granada with 600 participants, overview talks, but not just general overview talks just for your general interest, but with the purpose of converging also to the physics uh, briefing book that was input for the strategy. So a lot of parallel talks, lots of time for discussion, working group meetings, and that was a very intense, very uh, uh, lively meeting, I, uh, I must say. And this led to this physics briefing book of about 250 pages prepared by the physics preparatory group on the basis of these inputs and the open symposium. And here it is on the archive uh, as one book. Uh, and that was quite useful to have all together. Uh, it's still a good resource to look at uh, um, for all these different fields, like the weak physics, flavor physics, dark matter, uh, QCD, et cetera. So then after that, the final stage was a drafting session, and that was done at the Physics Center in Bad Honnef in Germany in January 2020, just before COVID struck. So the timing was very fortunate. We were with about 60 participants, lots of presentations, but particularly time for discussions, formulations. Every sentence in the report was discussed. The order of things was discussed. It was really quite intense. Um, and sessions lasted long uh, and uh, finished uh, after lunch on Saturday. And it must, for me, and I think for everyone, when finally, after this two year process, um, we all agreed on, okay, we agreed on this report to submit to council. That was a special moment, I must say. Uh, here you see the strategy, the, head, the strategy secretary, Helena Abramovic, uh, she was, uh, she guided the whole process uh, expertly. So this led to the update. It's not a long document. Maybe you've all read it. Uh, this is a slightly more expanded version with more text around it. Um, uh, and uh, it, it is good as, it's good to be a short document and not 250 pages. It's really worth quoting from. And what it contains is 20 strategy statements, two on major developments from the previous strategy, three on general things to keep in mind, two statements on high priority future initiatives, and then on other aspects I'll get to also in this presentation that are also very important and not to be seen as fillers, but actually something that is acted upon. So with a preamble here, of course, to uh, saying what, are, what is the motivation, what is the vision? Well, we need to look for new, uh, new to unveil the secrets of fundamental, fundamental physical laws at very, very small scales uh, and with high precision. So that led to the next facility being proposed as an E plus E minus factory or for Higgs factory, and also go to the energy frontier uh, eventually. So that's here in a nutshell, the European vision, prepare a Higgs factory followed by future hadron colliders. And that goes well beyond uh, the LHC sensitivities, but also addressing the technical environmental challenges. It's also an important part of this sentence. So what were the major developments from the 2013? Well, you know them. Uh, First of all, to, uh, make, uh, to upgrade the LHC to the high Lumi case and to actually make the neutrino physics program work. Um, other two high priorities were to do R&D for post LHC, uh, make our uh, uh, conceptual design reports for CLIC and FCC. And as I said, look forward to a proposal from Japan on the ILC. Now the LHC is certainly running well. So that's doing uh, after some COVID delays. Um, uh, so that part is really being done. The high Lumi construction is well underway. Uh, I visited some of the, uh, the tunnel work. It's really very impressive. The neutrino platform through which CERN participates in June in the US uh, works very well and the prototypes at CERN. It's the first time CERN participates in an experiment outside its own lab. Uh, so, uh, so that's uh, in the meantime also CERN has agreed to pay for the second cryostat at uh, June as well. So there's a continuous strong involvement of CERN and neutrino physics in the US, also in Japan through the T2K experiment. On the ILC, there's no further positive news. Uh, chicken and egg has been named uh, issue. 
it's been now so long that the chicken, the, the egg must have hatched. So I think we're dealing with two chickens, but I'm not sure what it does for the metaphor, but it's, uh, uh, it's uh, we wait, we'll see if we can need, as Shekhar said, how to break the cycle there. And the CDRs are done for these uh, uh, future machines. Now, general considerations were that uh, cooperation is a unique feature of the CERN model um, of the, of the uh, member states, associate member states, and the non-member states uh, in unique resources in science, human capital, uh, expertise, etc. And also to share and develop cutting edge technologies that is to the benefit of all. So this strategy update should be implemented to ensure Europe's continued scientific and technological leadership in this field. Now, this, all these countries have national labs here as well, and, uh, or not even formally national labs, but are certainly labs that are involved in the global enterprise of particle physics, all with their own speciality. And uh, it's good to have this ecosystem and not just concentrated things at one lab. So that's recognized here that European research centers provide a large variety of technical platforms, have synergies with other communities as well, NICA, for example, half does particle physics, half does astroparticle physics. And it also allows European research centers through the link to CERN to gain high visibility, which helps sustain them, of course. So this ecosystem, unique ecosystem should be strengthened. And, um, and that's another general consideration. Um, but that's Europe, uh, but particle physics is uh, going global. So um, it is, clear that the implementation of the strategy should proceed in strong collaboration with global partners, the US, uh, India, I see as part of Europe through CERN, uh, and uh, neighboring fields as well. I mean, the, uh, so that's, that's an important um, uh, thing to keep in mind and, uh, and to live by. So in terms of high priority future initiatives, I like this plot that Ursula Bussler made. It's full of information. Uh, if you study it a bit more carefully, maybe you've seen it in form of another, but every, every item has information. So there's the various types of possible future colliders, Japan, China, CERN, uh, the preparation phase, the construction phase, the height of the box is the cost per year. Uh, there's a tunnel phase. So there's a lot of information in there. It's, it's probably already out of date. It's two years old. Uh, probably everything has moved to the right, not to the left. Uh, but you see here the, 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 all the options that were on the table and also discussed. So uh, the strategy felt that it is essential for particle physics in Europe and for CERN to have a new facilities after the LHC. There must be a flagship project at CERN for the viability of the lab. If there isn't, that would be, I think, very detrimental to its future. So there are two ways. Uh, there, the Higgs factory and the exploration of the energy frontier. And um, uh, so that those are also the high priority future initiatives to establish a Higgs factory, uh, which one is still to be determined. Uh, FCCEE at the, at the moment is plan A, um, but there's other options. Click is, uh, is, is a possibility for, for plan B. And then in the future go to FCCHH. And the main uh, Advice here, the main uh, uh, thing to follow up on was a feasibility study with such a uh, collider. This little phrase generates a huge activity. So there were, this study is well underway. There were committees, there was a steering committee, there's a collaboration board all under the ages of the council. Large sets of topics to be addressed. Uh, there is gonna be an important midterm review of the end of 2023 uh, with a special council session early in 2024 to uh, uh, judge it and to, uh, and to take stock. Um, and there's a lot of stuff that has to be done there, as many of you know, um, the governance of the feasibility study, but also deal with the, uh, with the legal aspect of geology. There's a lot of stuff to deal with. Now, important part of this is, of course, uh, how do you get those accelerators? Uh, and we heard talk just before that uh, on, and the main uh, effort here is the high field magnets. That is expected to take about 20 years to get up to 16 Tesla for no beam tin. Uh, 20 if you can do high temperature superconductors, but that requires a long research program. As a theorist, I, I asked also, what if you have twice the money, can you do it in half the time? That is not, not the case. It's really, things take time. And uh, uh, so, but of course, other things are important in this R&D program as well. Plasma acceleration and muon collider, ERLs, all of these things we heard already talks about. 
Uh, and uh, the main charge here was to develop an accelerator R&D roadmap, which is now complete. It was compiled by the laboratory directors group. It's been approved by council and now the implementation phase starts. Uh, we heard already about all the efforts there. So I think there is a lot of uh, synergy to be made perhaps also with the US uh, in this, particularly in the high field magnets. I think there was a lot of synergy already, right? Um, but there are other essential activities and most of the uh, puzzles we have are often from astroparticles. The dark matter is one, flavor physics is another that is very important with flavor physics. You can look beyond the energy of the present collider through, uh, through virtual effects. So here also there's a lot of uh, vigorous studies already going on. Also in the physics beyond collider group, that's an important group. Um, the, there's also things said that limited things. So for example, the beam dump facility and the LHE scene were seen as too expensive at this point to pursue. So this was not, uh, this, uh, was not so good news for an experiment, proposed experiment like SHIP, for example. Um, the good news, of course, that the EIC uh, is gonna come and that also has also for LHC physics an important, for all of hadron physics, an important uh, impact through the impacts on part and distribution functions. A lot of these experiments are also done at, uh, at national labs and smaller experiments. And my impression is also in the Netherlands, the funding for these lower things seems quite healthy for these smaller experiments in Europe. Uh, theory uh, is an important thing, also mentioned already by Shekhar. It's, uh, it has both formal aspects and of course these precision techniques, calculational methods that are increasingly talking to each other. That's a very interesting new development. And here already there is a global collaboration. Uh, important to have resources enough here. Um, also for the long time scales that you need for these difficult calculations for building Monte Carlo event generators, new lattice calculations. But also theory allows for, as, as, as a real source of inspiration for many students that I constantly uh, uh, observe again uh, and often uh, the students come for the theory and stay for the R&D, and that's a great way to uh, get people into labs as well. Um, this is another very important one for the strategy, so detector R&D. Also here the charge is to start a roadmap uh, guided now by ECFA and not the laboratory directors group. Uh, and here this was a very well executed process of getting the roadmap done, and this is now complete. Um, it is now starting the implementation phase. And one of the new aspects is that detector R&D collaboration structures have now been defined. Uh, and uh, uh, so on various topics, we heard about quantum sensing. And here, I think there are also possibilities for India R&D to uh, engage in, this, uh, in these detectors and to some extent already are, as far as I understand. So these are things that really came out of feasibility study. Two roadmaps have been done and that, and they really have consequences. Uh, so uh, they move the field forward. Uh, but the same is also true for computing. There's, uh, there's not a roadmap, but here progress is largely self-propelled AI and, and all kinds of new techniques finding their way into particle physics research. We had talks on, uh, on that. Uh, and also quantum computing increasingly shows, uh, shows up in, uh, in, um, uh, as a method for analyzing uh, data, uh, also for, for doing uh, the, uh, event generation. Uh, so it has this profound R&D in its own right, not just a service. And here also an, there's an important aspect that experts need to be trained to address these things. We need to think about that and not just assume they will be there, but make it interesting enough to feel for people to want to join also in this area. Another important neighboring field, which you also heard at this meeting, is nuclear physics. Um, nuclear physics enjoys many more facilities than particle physics does, uh, uh, these, such as Isolde, Entoff, Fair, Nika, ESS, etc. All this is uh, in Europe, and there's, uh, there's also uh, nuclear physics facilities here and in, and in the US, so they have that variety. Um, now, for us, for particle physics, uh, there is the clear link through Isolde and Alice, and I think India is strongly involved there. And so here there is a natural link. We also had a nice talk by Vandana on this. QCD theorists uh, are very interested in the EIC, of course. So there's also that theory link there with nuclear physics on that side. And now as to particle physics is another very important one, and a bit always a bit of a, of a subtle one. 
if you think about it, all the fundamental challenges to our field come from astroparticle particle physics, my dark matter, dark energy, the baryogenesis. So they, as the particle poses the big questions to us and what can we do about it? So these synergies uh, need to be uh, identified um, and, they're not, and they're not just, uh, uh, they're not just at the physics level, but also at the tech level, computing infrastructure. So there's a lot of cross particle across um, cross field uh, uh, fertilization. That field has its own strategy uh, design, uh, coordinated by APEC and they seek strong cooperation and CERN is also involved in that, but it is uh, a little bit gingerly. Uh, there's, a, there's a proposal to establish a new structure like le recognized experiments, but it should be done in a cost neutral way. So that is a bit of a boundary condition there. But in practice, this is overcome. For example, I know that the Einstein telescope has now offices at CERN and CERN helps there with governance, civil engineering and vacuum technology. So on the ground level, there is a lot of collaboration already. Um, of course, uh, the field is getting increasingly global and CERN is also here thinking about the governance. Um, the same thing that snow mass process was thinking of. One of the working groups was addressing this topic. So uh, that um, uh, of the six working groups that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, but there is now also a, a larger working group on governance of CERN, which has as one of its charges, what will be the governance in future global projects? So if you have say an FCC at CERN, would you, you cannot deal with just the present governments, you would have major outside contributors and they would want to say, so how do you go about that? That's an interesting question that, we go, that we're now pondering. Conversely, if there is a large facility outside CERN, uh, how do you go about that? That's a bit easier than most of the CERN member states would be participate through CERN, but all of these things are still, of course, to be decided when the, when the need arises. Um, this is more on the general thing, but open science is important for making what we do accessible to, uh, to the world, uh, to also gather the information that the world has to offer. And um, so this is now uh, more or less in internalized, I think, by most of us. Particle physics is very fortunate that they don't have to think about it in practice too much, thanks to the scope three agreement that, that lets you use the usual journals, and it is open source. Uh, but it is demanded by funding agencies. And so we can, I don't know how it is in India, but we have to publish in open science uh, journals. And uh, it's not just open, uh, open publishing, but also open science in other, in other fashions. And CERN, of course, is being uh, the birthplace of the World Wide Web. Is, uh, this is nothing strange to CERN. Um, it was also mentioned in Shikhar's talk, energy and, uh, is an important thing. Um, uh, and uh, anyway, uh, the relation of particle physics to climate change. Now, there was, it was a bit unfortunate, serendipity. Uh, one advises to reduce travel. Now, that, that happened very quickly after the draft, drafting session, travel just stopped. Um, and, um, so, and, we, and we learned new ways of, of meeting. Um, now, the significant efforts now at CERN go towards sustainability on many, many levels. So CERN is really making an effort there. And, uh, and energy is now a major cost factor. Uh, CERN has green energy in the sense that it's carbon free because they get all the energy from France, which uses nuclear power stations. So that's in some sense, it's green. Um, but uh, uh, the, the, the energy uh, is a major issue, major concern for the future. Um, an even bigger major concern perhaps is how do you get the next generation involved as I as said, especially given the long time scales and how do you go about it? That's not an easy question. The, the field is mixed. I've heard input uh, when young people in the UK were asked, do you mind if the accelerator is that far in the future? And they didn't mind all that much if the, active, if the work on the way was interesting enough. So it is not necessarily um, an enormous hill to climb, but it must be, it must seriously be thought of and, and perhaps many answers must be possible. It is important here that, of course, equality, diversion and inclusion are part of the process and really visible, so everyone can participate. Make careers also possible, also not just in science, but also in R&D. If you want to detect R&D or uh, computing R&D, there should be a career for you and you should be able to get recognition for that. That was a major topic of uh, attention. Knowledge transfer, that's also important, of course. Um, 
Uh, CERN has a, a dedicated program for that. And always when we visit CERN, there's always a, a talk by the knowledge transfer uh, uh, department. Uh, and it's important to have good relations with industries. And certainly for us, industrial liaison officer is key to this, to it, that makes the link between uh, industry and, and, uh, and uh, on our field. And uh, this could be perhaps an idea for India. We, in the Netherlands, we have a business incubator center that really uh, is a site where these things are made naturally. And perhaps this is a possibility to consider here. Uh, and of course, public engagement, uh, very important to keep people interested in what we do. Uh, my feeling is actually particle physics is doing very well here. We shouldn't stop, we should continue, but I think we're way ahead of many other subfields in physics, at least that's my uh, interpretation. And we have a lot of activity already going on that we should keep that. So what are then the next steps uh, after this? As I said, the strategy is now uh, more than two years old. Um, as I said, CERN uses the strategy to allocate its resources and it does that through its five medium term plan, which is always now plus five years in the budget. And really the items from the strategy are identified in there and get money. Uh, the magnet field research, the muon collider, the click gets uh, funding, uh, the, et cetera, all the, part, all the major parts in the strategy get funded in that way. Uh, the LEC program is uh, on its way to uh, forward again, and the ILUMI uh, upgrade is also moving forward, as is the feasibility study. Of course, uh, Council had to deal with the energy crisis, uh, has to deal with energy, and that's not solved yet. That's a major challenge. And we have still the uh, crisis that one, uh, member, one observer state uh, was aggressive to a member state, so that's a major problem. The, uh, on the more positive side, the roadmaps uh, in R&D for detectors and accelerators are being implemented, and there's lots of activities going on there, and there's very good progress on the other goals, the transversal goals uh, that I mentioned. Uh, the next update, that will be an important one, because that will reach a decision on the FCC, and what, whether it will be plan A, B. Uh, so that's something we need to keep in mind and, and be engaged with. I think that would really set the stage for, uh, for the future, and not just for CERN, but perhaps globally. That was not all I had to say. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Uh, your wonderful talk, not only the science, also the surrounding things related to the, our science. Yeah. Any now the floor is open to the question or comment. Thanks, Eric. The great, great talk. So I have lived on both sides of the Atlantic and I know how things are done very differently. Uh, from the European strategy and the SNOMAS. But I want to address the two things you mentioned is this business about uh, sustainability and energy. And the other thing about culture change, about uh, scale, with time scales going longer and longer. And we're talking about 100 years kind of time scale on how to motivate the younger people. Right. So we have a working group, working group 14 in IUPAP, International Union for Physics and Applied. Uh, uh, we are discussing these two, these two issues with ESS, European Exploration Source, as an example for zero carbon footprint right. facility. And so that is, accelerator people have to work hard on it, how to make it happen. Right. It's on us, not on you guys, not particle physicists. And the second thing is actually we need help from particle physicists about why the project can be on a 100 year time scale. We must provide low hanging scientific fruits so that younger generation can see while the bigger goal is over there, right. but on the way we'll get a lot of things. Right. And that we have not done very well yeah. in the last 50 years. So yeah, we need I, your help in doing I'm, that. So on the last part, I've had some, I asked people now and then, uh, yeah. uh, how, what's your view on this? And, and, and uh, one or two people had this interesting notion of not just being part of an experiment, yes. of one experiment, but perhaps of a particle physics one and a smaller astroparticle spin at the same mm. time, which is much shorter time scale. Right. So it gives a variety, it keeps you mm. interested. Right. How to organize that is perhaps exactly. complicated, exactly. but I think if, if you think about it a bit more creatively, yeah. that could be a sort of uh, yeah. thing. To, it's a bit like when the LSC was being built, people were a member of the bar of D0, uh, et cetera, and at the same time of Atlas and, and LSCB. So yeah. you can do things along the way. Right. Uh, so, I mean, accelerator people is easy to do because we get this magnet, a little RF, right. a little laser, but the particle physicists have to also get something out of it. No, no. And that's the thing is hard. I mean, yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. So right. We need to we need to talk about it. Right. right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. I have a question on the feasibility review that you were mentioning that mm -hmm. is right underway. Were there any 
goals set that should be reached? Or was it say you do the evaluation and later we see whether we think that's okay? I, I guess it also concerns financial costs and technical feasibility, for example, right. magnets, et cetera. Yeah. Right. And I think it's uh, this clear clear goals. I mean, to uh, uh, to I mean, a tunnel is a big thing, of course. But how do you deal with the tunnel? With the geology, with the with the legal framework around it, with the outreach around uh, around the, having tunnels going underneath here and an accelerator going underneath about the, the, the financing plan. How would you go about it with possible outside contributors? CERN cannot pay this from its own budget. We need outside uh, contributions. So yeah, it's gonna be fairly concrete because the member states want it. Uh, they want to have a first, they want to have an early view of whether they can get their governments ready to provide the extra funds needed for a while for, the, uh, for, the, for, such, a, for, for such a new machine. So, so it must be concrete, absolutely. Hello, uh, regarding the knowledge transfer. Yeah. So it's like an open source or it comes with a fee from CERN? Uh, I th uh, as, as far, it's mostly open science as far as I know. Uh, uh, certainly anything that goes from CERN to a company will be, will be open. Right? This, that's just uh, enshrined in the rules. Uh, um, it could be that if you, I'm not sure if you, if, if that's a knowledge transfer, of course you can, if you, Procure something from a company; it can come with an IP. Uh, I think, but uh, uh, I think it's the idea is still is open. Absolutely. Uh, I had a, two small questions. You said that uh, the, uh, what is that the uh, states like India and so on they pay ten percent of the member states. Right. Uh, but how many? What is the fraction uh, that the member states pay of their GDP? Oh. Uh, is it like half a percent or no? Oh, I don't know. Or maybe even uh, smaller or what is it? Well, I just need one country to calibrate, right? So uh, uh, it's, 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 uh, it's no, it's not, not half, it's much smaller than half a percent. Much smaller? Sorry? No, is it much smaller or larger? Much smaller than half a percent of the GDP. Okay. Okay. I think it's at the order of 10 to minus four. Okay, yeah, the, the yeah, other, okay, smaller. maybe we can discuss yeah. it. Okay, I can ask. Uh, no, but so sure I, I, I know, I know the, the Netherlands pays 50 million. Yeah, yeah. The Netherlands pays 50 yeah. million uh, Swiss francs. Yeah, okay, Swiss uh, and I think this, uh, okay, this discussion we had, I think way back in 2010. And uh, okay, the CERN budget is uh, okay, basically maintained by the member states in proportion to their GDP. Right. For the, okay, at that time, we, okay, India suggested that we should, uh, okay, we should not pay. Uh, in proportion to our GDP, but at some fraction, and it was discussed a bit, and we eventually came to that 10% level. Okay, so that we pay 10% of, of what we would pay that's right. That's right. if it was in proportion right. to our GDP. That's also the minimum. So you cannot yes. go Okay, that is the minimum. Yeah. I mean, you could pay more, but but not that's less right. than 10%. And a few countries pay more because they're on the way to full membership. And then there's a few years where you have to ramp up your Well, that, yeah, okay, that was a different thing. But, okay, but you would start with at least 10% of it's what you would have to pay right. if you were paying it's your a, full contribution according to your GDP. Okay, it's at least 10% it. and surprisingly, most countries pay just 10%. <laughs> uh, another, small, another small question. The, with regard to your open access journal, so who pays actually for the... Is it uh, so this is the or... this is the scope three. It's actually the library fees and it oh, pays the library. library fees. So, so you don't pay author journal, processing. You you pay for that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So you don't pay author processing charges. The libraries do it for you. Oh. Yeah. Can I? So I, I just checked. So the uh, British GDP in 2022 is 559 billion pounds. The contribution to the uh, CERN budget, approximately 100 million, right? So you're, to, so you're yeah. talking about uh, two per mil, to, sorry, two times 10 to minus four. Okay. So, so your estimate. First approximation is just right. Yeah. I read somewhere uh, that uh, when the American public was asked, what do you think uh, a fraction of the budget goes to NASA? Most people estimated 10%. So uh, people are usually <laughs> fairly off. <laughs> you know. Okay, uh, you mentioned something about uh, the member states uh, wanting to be prepared for the extra contribution towards the project like FCC. So does it mean that 
for that period and for that project, CERN would ask um, member states and associate member states to increase their well, contributions? I, I, is uh, that what is foreseen? Probably, but if it's for a tunnel, I doubt you're going to get extra contributions from countries that don't contain the tunnel. So I think there the, uh, the expectation is the host nation, Switzerland and France, and perhaps external contribution from the US could, uh, could help. There has been mention of that. Okay, but so that's um, but not from. I don't think other countries would readily pay for that. I was just curious. Yeah. That's why I was curious. Yeah. Okay, I think no more person. Thanks, Eric. Again. Okay. okay. Now we come back across this Arabian Sea and come back to India. See this. What is this Indian project? Yeah, Doctor by in Doctor Indumut. Five minutes. Thank you. Okay, I will begin by uh, apologizing to those whose work I cannot cover because time is finite and uh, I will talk about uh, a little bit of the physics and the simulations work that we have done for INO, but I think I will already say that uh, because there has been so much delay, which I think everybody knows. Uh, it's also been a plus point because it's given us more time in which to work out more of the physics goals, but the physics goals keep shifting. So that's a game you really cannot win. Whatever it is, I will uh, present it here. And I thank the organizers for uh, giving me this uh, opportunity to uh, make this presentation. There's a lag between the two, which is very unnerving. I think I will go to the other side. Uh, now I understand what the other speakers were saying. So here are the neutrinos in red from the sun. And uh, oh, okay, ah, yeah, it is very slow, I'm sorry. So uh, here is the, here are the classic results of the solar neutrino experiments. Yeah. Yeah, 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 I'm going forward. I know exactly what I'm doing. No, no, I have lots of slides and <laughs> there's a length contraction involved because time is limited. So yeah, I'm, I'm fine with this. Everybody knows those neutrinos from the sun, so I don't have to show them further than that. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, this is the classic results of the solar neutrino experiments uh, where uh, the solar neutrinos were measured in three modes, uh, very early experiments uh, uh, from charge current uh, scattering where the new, new E becomes electron and they found one third of the uh, expected events. Then came the uh, Japanese experiment with pure water, where they found half the expected events. And while they were still figuring out whether these are actually neutrinos from the sun, because that was really what Kamioka showed, that there was this peak with respect to the instantaneous direction with respect to the sun. There came along the snow experiment, really beautiful experiment, which measured not only these charge current and the elastic scattering events and confirmed the earlier results, but also showed that in the neutral current sector, where every neutrino counts, not just the new E's which were expected to come from the sun, that this ratio is actually equal to the expected rate. And therefore the sun does shine in neutrinos exactly as Bakal and his collaborators had predicted. And the reason for the shortfall therefore is neutrino oscillations. It's the property of the neutrino. And these neutrino oscillations in two flavors can be uh, expressed pictorially as uh, two mass eigenstates we're mixing in a proportion pro, uh, proportional to this angle theta for two flavors, so that as you move along in distance away from the source, you either have uh, you have different amounts of nu e and nu mu, or nu nu one and nu two, and that gives you the 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 observed depletion of the neutrinos from the sun, 
And the SNOW experiment confirmed that these are actually uh, uh, due to oscillations and not due to any other properties such as uh, decoherence, decay, many other possibilities were ruled out over time. And you can extend this uh, uh, analysis to the three flavors in a very direct fashion. You just have many more mixing angles and, uh, and uh, mass square differences. Now, uh, once this was established, of course, uh, you have neutrinos from several sources. And uh, oscillations were seen in many of them. And in, in this context, the India-based neutron observatory, uh, actually two decades ago, proposed uh, the possibility to build such an underground neutrino detector. So the proposal actually contains both the observatory itself and the, and the uh, detector as well. Uh, to study in particular atmospheric neutrinos. So what will INO do or what does INO propose to do? It is actually a funded project. It's funded uh, as a mega science project by both the Department of Science and Technology and the Department of Atomic Energy, which are the uh, traditional funding agencies for particle physics in India. Uh, immediate goal, <laughs> which is not so immediate, but continues to remain uh, the prime focus uh, is the creation of an underground laboratory for research in neutrino physics. But we expect that it will actually diversify into many other areas of science because it is a facility that is available and will always be useful. And what is also funded are two other components of this uh, lab. One is the, uh, the main detector to study neutrinos, which is the magnetized ion calorimeter detector, which will study atmospheric neutrinos, as I said, and also a, a center for particle physics and detector technology, R&D, which is a very important component that as, as we uh, proposed, uh, sorry about the breathlessness, old COVID remnant, uh, will, uh, well, we, which is already functioning at Madurai, but in borrowed premises and also uh, requires its own, uh, own uh, uh, whatever look, uh, location, which is, sorry? No, no, it is not slow or fast. The breathlessness shows up in the in the microphone because of the COVID. So it's, it sounds very bad, but I'm sorry, I cannot help it. I, it's not fast. Okay, so the other, other, other thing I want to really emphasize about INO is the graduate training program, which was started 13 or 14 years ago, I think now, uh, to train students. And it, it was very special because these students got uh, trained in both experimental and theoretical aspects of, of the detector. And I think it was a very unique project. It's not, not it, the, we have the last batch of students still with us, but we have not taken students for the last three years because of certain uncertainties in the proposal itself. And I think that this is, a, this is something that really should be revived because it has been extremely successful. And in fact, whatever I'm going to show you from now on would not have been possible without the contribution of these students. And the final statement, of course, it's a completely indigenous project and uh, something therefore very special to me at least. So what is it that we will study here in ICAL? So the detector ICAL is a magnetized ion calorimeter detector. Uh, borrowed the slide from Super K, but it's the same physics. Cosmic rays come, come in, produce secondary pions, which decay to muon type neutrinos, and the muon itself decays to both mu and nu e type neutrinos. So you're going to get mu is to e in the ratio of two is to one. And any deviation from this ratio is a signature of oscillations, which already Super K has established. So what is the particular uh, uh, unique aspect of, of ICAL then? That the interactions that we are interested in, when nu mu on the charge current interaction goes to mu minus, and the anti mu goes to mu plus, and the magnetized ion calorimeter tells you that mu minus and mu plus will bend differently in the magnetic field. And therefore I can count them separately, which means I can count nu mu differently from the nu mu bar. And since the nu mu and nu mu bar, this is, the surface of the earth, but there is an atmosphere on the other side, and there are neutrinos produced from the other side. And when those neutrinos go through the earth uh, and hit, reach the detector, the matter effects that the neutrinos experience on passing through the earth are different from the matter effects that the anti-neutrinos experience on going through the earth. And therefore we will be able to distinguish the neutrino and uh, nu mu and nu mu bar interactions or the matter effect with respect to the earth. And that will enable us to focus on one particular property, which I am going to tell you what it is. So in a, in a moment when I talk about the physics part. So in, in particular, the, the goal of the, the proposed ICAL detector will have three modules, uh, which are 17 kilotons each of iron uh, layers separated by a gap, air gap, in which will sit the active detector elements, which are the RPCs, which are just glass plates with gas flowing inside at a high voltage. And when 
a charged particle like a muon passes through, uh, it uh, discharges the gas in a localized fashion. Uh, there are pickup strips in, uh, say, x direction on the top, in the y direction below, and the localization is three centimeter by three centimeter, and that's the pixel size of hit that you get in the detector. And as the muon passes through the detector, you're going to get a long track of these hits with uh, both uh, uh, spatial location and timing, which is a order of a nanosecond. So the highlights of this, there are many uh, factors. The magnetic field in the center of the detector is around 1.5 Tesla, uh, small compared to even, a, even an MRI machine. Total number of RPC units is about 30,000 uh, of about two meter by two meter uh, dimension approximately. And the main challenge is that the associated electronic channels for this is nearly 4 million. So this is not something that can be done in a lab, although there are many research institutions and universities as associated with ICAL. It needs a large industry interface. And so the, the, the objective or the process that has happened over the last few years is to start out with the R&D in these research institutions and then to do a technology transfer to industry. Okay, so this is in ICAL in brief. So what is the physics that we can learn from ICAL? So uh, we start out with putting the known parameters in context. Uh, essentially, what Shubhavati talked about uh, already yesterday, I will simply highlight what is required for our uh, physics goals. So we start out by looking at the mass square differences, which are not very well known. Uh, the solar mass difference is uh, about uh, 60 to 80 times smaller than the atmospheric mass difference. Uh, these are the three mass eigenstates. There's a small red color over here. It may, may not be visible. So the, the color combinations over here show the admixtures uh, of these flavor eigenstates in the mass eigenstates. And this very small value, which corresponds, uh, sorry, should I put that earlier, corresponds to theta 1, 3, the cross generation mixing of about 8 to 9 degrees, uh, tells you that uh, it is possible to measure uh, uh, delta CP, the CP violating phase. Uh, in the neutrino sector, because if theta 1, 3 is zero, then that phase is not measurable. So this was a very important result that came out from the reactor neutrino experiments uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, the other quantity that is an open question is uh, theta 2, 3 looks maximal. Is it exactly maximal? Is it greater than 45? Is it in the second octant or less than 45 in the first octant? That is a question. And the third question is, is M3 squared the most massive or the least massive of these mass eigenstates, because the solar and uh, Kamlan experiments have established that M2 is heavier than M1, but we don't know whether M3 is the heaviest or lightest mass eigenstate, and that is the mass ordering problem. So in this context uh, that we are going to build uh, INO, we are going to focus on primarily these issues. What is the mass ordering, which leads to the mass hierarchy, because that depends on the absolute zero of the mass scale, and what is the octant of uh, theta 2, 3. So here is a quick primer. Let us look at the mass ma matter effects. I talked to you already about neutrinos coming through the Earth, interacting with Earth matter, and reaching the detector. And this red highlighted object is the primary consideration. You can see that there is a ratio, which is uh, A, the matter-dependent matter uh, uh, effect. The, uh, it's actually uh, twice energy times the matter potential, uh, divided by the mass squared difference of the three and one mass eigenstates. And you can see that since the mass, uh, the sign of delta is not known, and the neutrinos uh, have positive A, whereas antineutrinos have negative A, this quantity can become zero if A and delta are both greater than zero, or A and delta are both less than zero. Which means that if the mass ordering is normal, so delta is greater than zero, then you will have a resonance effect possible where theta 1, 3 can become maximal in, in the neutrino sector. And if it's negative, then you will have the resonance, MSW resonance in the anti neutrino sector. And that's why with the magnetized ICAL, you can separate your new mu and your new mu bar. And therefore, you will be able to tell whether you have resonance in this sector or that sector, which means you can unambiguously pinpoint the hierarchy. So uh, that just says more of the same thing. So I will skip it. And this says more of the same thing too. And I will skip it. So I come next to the octant of theta 2, 3. So here, it's a, it's a subleading effect. So already the matter effect was uh, suppressed by the factor of sine squared uh, uh, theta 1, 3, which is small. And the, the octant effect, you can see that 2 theta 2, 3 is not sensitive to the octant. It has to be theta 2, 3, which is sensitive to the octant. And that factor is coming with, uh, the, with the term uh, sine squared 2 theta 1, 3 matter, which can, of course, be enhanced 
but it is a small subleading effect. So the octet is going to be even harder to do than, and this is a generic statement, not necessarily tied to ICAL itself. And uh, the current status of this parameter is that these are the global fits from two different, uh, the left side is from uh, the 2006 paper, the right side is from the 2007 archive number. And you can see that here, this prefers, the best fit uh, prefers to be in the second octant, uh, uh, whereas, and this is for both the normal and the inverted uh, ordering, whereas on the right-hand side, you see the updated Neutrino 2020 Super K data, which used to prefer the second octant, but now prefers the first octant. So in my opinion, I would say that the issue of the octant is still open, and this is something that we can ask a question about. The main thing to, to, to realize is that the, both the octant and the uh, matter mass ordering effects, which can be determined by ICAL, are going to be independent of the CP phase, and that will be something very important I will come to later. Okay, so here I show, uh, just look at the top three uh, portions, uh, or in fact, just look at the central top one, which has theta 139 degrees with 5 GV neutrino energy. So one thing I forgot to highlight earlier, which I am now highlighting, if you look at this little structure over here, uh, we have assumed normal ordering. And so that's the, that's the core crossing effect at uh, uh, theta is around 30 degrees, 33 degrees. That's when it just starts to graze uh, the inner core of the Earth, so you can see the you can see the effect of of the MSW resonance. And the second is that uh, the octant you, I have taken three and uh, black is the is the maximal mixing, uh, the red is uh, less than forty five and the blue is more than forty five, and so they will go in opposite directions, and that will give you the sensitivity to the octant. You can see this somewhat better in 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 this next slide, uh, where uh, where I have shown PE mu rather than P mu mu, although its contribution is small. So. Uh, so what you will find is that uh, you do have sensitivity to the octant. This, for example, shows you if I've taken the theta 2, 3 to be, say, uh, away from maximal in the first quadrant, say, 40 degrees, and I've assumed two different values of theta 1, 3 with the true value being in between, then at, uh, uh, if, if theta 1, 3 was smaller, say, about 7 degrees, it would not uh, rule out the second octant spurious solution. But if theta 1, 3 is larger, then it will rule it out. So the octant solution, all I'm trying to say is, is going to be a complex interplay between the true, true value of theta 2, 3 itself and the value of theta 1, 3 as well. And in fact, it also depends on the right-hand side on the true value of delta m squared. So it's going to be a very difficult measurement. Okay. And of course, here results are much poorer. I've taken, I've assumed normal hierarchy and first octant. But you, if you start out with the true octant being in the second octant, then the results are always poorer. That's because of the way the expressions depend on, on this parameter. So this is roughly the physics that we want to study. And this has been put into a simulations framework uh, with, uh, with the giant four based uh, simulation uh, programs uh, using uh, the Honda 3D atmospheric neutrino flux. And most of the results that I will show you is with events from the nuance uh, neutrino generator, though some of the more recent results are from Gini. Uh, they are not very different as far as this, uh, these results are uh, concerned. And the magnetic field map has been generated using a Magnet 6.0 software. So with this framework, we have used the Kalman filter algorithm because so this is a typical, uh, very exaggerated, you will not find such events, such clean events very often in the detector. This is more for us to appreciate that here is a vertex at the point, as a little hadron shower, which doesn't travel very far and the muons which go as long thin tracks. And so those tracks are, those track events are uh, separated out with an, a Kalman filter used uh, to, to reconstruct the sign of the charge. So whether it's new, new mu or anti new mu events, and of course the magnitude of the momentum as well, and whether it's up or down from the timing. Uh, the hadron energy is reconstructed by calibrating the total events. And uh, most of the results that I'm going to quote are from the INO white paper, which is here. So when I, when I don't have a reference, then it's from the INO white paper. So here is, the muon response, uh, the, the resolution of the detector in the momentum, muon momentum, sigma by, by P, it doesn't matter what these are. Here uh, you have momenta from one to 20 GV, and you can see that the design of INO is, or ICAL is such that the best response is at five to 10 GV where you have the MSW effect. So where the max matter effects are maximum, you have designed the detector to have the maximum sen sensitivity. You also have a sensitivity to hadrons, uh, not, not so good, but not so bad either. There is information in the hadrons that I will show you later. And here is the reconstruction efficiency around greater than 80% for more vertical angles and the charge ID efficiency, which is better than 98% for almost all energies, momenta greater than 2 GeV and a very good angular resolution of about one degree for the muons. So with this uh, simulations background, these are the study results that we have got. 
uh, here, uh, here is the, the basic precision measurement as a function of sine squared theta two, three, and the modulus, that is the magnitude of, of delta m squared three, two. So on the left-hand side, I have shown you uh, from this reference, the current limits from various experiments in the different colors. And I have tried to blow up this right side figure so that the scales match even though they are shifted, the central values are shifted so that the sizes of the potatoes are actually to, can be compared realistically. And the red potato on the right is what I know ICAL will achieve. But uh, you must remember that ICAL is yet to be built. So that is something we should always keep in mind. Other experiments are running, taking data, and will, it will improve as we go along. So the next uh, physics goal, which is the major physics goal of ICAL is, uh, is the mass ordering. So here, what I have shown is that, suppose I assume the normal ordering and I ask, how well can, uh, can we discriminate against the wrong ordering uh, by marginalizing all other parameters and ask what the delta chi square is for that? You'll see that in the runtime of 10 years for both true ordering being normal or inverted, I will be able to have a three sigma determination of this quantity. Uh, and the black line versus the red line is without and with the inclusion of the hadron. So even though the hadrons are not very well determined, the hadron energy actually improves this result. So uh, this result, however, is completely independent of the unknown CP phase. And I will tell you a little more about it when we come to synergies with other experiments. I just want to make one, one comment over here. I think this is a very famous graph. Uh, this is the lightest mass uh, neutrino uh, against the mass that will be measured in the neutrino less double beta experiment. And you can see that the, whether you have normal or inverted hierarchy has implications for both the model building and for discovery of neutrino less beta, double beta decay. And so this is a very, very important question. So the matter effect of the mass hierarchy, which is the centerpiece of uh, ICAL physics, is actually such an important experiment that Minos, T2K, Nova, Pingu, Ice Cube, Juno, Dune, Hyper-K, LBNE, and I'm sure I've forgotten other experiments are all probing this experiment, uh, this, this quantity, because it's such an amazing uh, and such an important quantity. And each is an amazing experiment and each has different ways of doing this, as the community will know. And I think that INO will actually be complementary in its in its uh, approach to determining this quantity, in particular, because many of these other or most of these other experiments have to disentangle the unknown CP phase effects from this quantity. But as I said, ICAL is independent of the CP phase. So that is something that we keep in mind when I talk about synergies. There is, I will briefly go through this. There are some updates on other physics with ICAL and where I have mentioned actually the references because they're not in the white paper. So you can, you, what happens if you actually look at the electron neutrinos, which are also there, you have very limited uh, 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 sensitivity, but you do have sensitivity. When you include the tau neutrinos, which are actually quite large in number, you can improve the, the octane sensitivity uh, to ICAL when that uh, tau neutrinos are combined along with the standard muon neutrino analysis. Uh, there's other, other studies that have been done, steriles, uh, probing non-standard interactions, probing neutrino decay, looking for signatures of Lorentz invariance violation. And of course, since atmospheric neutrinos come from, from 4 pi, you can do earth tomography because you, you remember that I showed you that the, the, the matter effect is, uh, is actually enhanced when the neutrinos actually do core crossing. So I will pick out actually two uh, non uh, oscillation non neutrino physics results, which I thought are interesting, which are also there in the white paper. Uh, one is uh, solar dark matter. So when uh, you have a concentration of WIMPs in the sun, they annihilate and give you, so this is not uh, oscillation physics, but just detection of these muons. And the left-hand side shows the spin dependent and the spin independent cross-section limits. And the red colors are coming from ICAL and the other colors are from every other experiment. And of course you can see that xenon and lux uh, will beat every other uh, experiment, but there is sensit significant sensitivity from, from ICAL as well towards this dark matter. Uh, other is uh, heavy objects like magnetic monopoles can be determined from measuring their velocities. And you can see that this is the macro limit. Uh, this is the mass, masses in 10 power 16, 10 power 17 GeV range. And uh, these are the flux bounds that can be uh, determined uh, from, from the measurements uh, at ICAL over 10 years. So the bottom line, I think, is that there are a lot of exciting possibilities with this experiment. And so there, there's also been interest in, in looking to see how you can tweak, yeah, thank you. You can tweak ICAL uh, to, to improve or enhance the capability with respect to other, uh, other parameters. Uh, so I call them ICAL++. For example, uh, having additional side uh, scintillator detectors uh, to look for what are called collar events, which is a kind of in the indirect dark matter detection in the 10 to 50 GeV range. Uh, 
which was related to the Kolar events. Uh, the low energy physics of atmospheric neutrinos, which is extremely sensitive, the curves correspond to different delta CP values. So it's a very, very uh, amazing fact that uh, atmospheric neutrino fluxes at high energies above 5 GeV are very sensitive. Uh, to the hierarchy and independent of delta CP, but the low energies, this is at 0 0.2 to 0.8 GeV, are sensitive to delta CP and independent of the of the neutrino mass hierarchy, and therefore will be sensitive to the CP phase. So they're completely hierarchy insensitive, and therefore they will have sensitivity to the delta CP. But this is this has to be an enhanced detector; it cannot be the original one. So there are additional synergies with other experiments. Since, as we have, I have claimed so many times, the, the uh, hierarchy dependence is independent of the CP phase. It will help when combined with NOVA, LBL reactors to, to enhance uh, the significance of, of the hierarchy over the entire uh, delta CP range. You can see that otherwise they do not have sensitivity uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, half plane. Similarly, for the, this is for the, for the mass hierarchy measurement to improve it so that you can actually reach three sigma in, in six years by combining with T2K and NOVA. And the, the measurement of delta CP can also be enhanced by, by including the ICAL data. So there are many synergies uh, and uh, I think they, can, they are being explored further. Uh, so now I come to what exactly is the R&D status. Uh, what is the current status of I INO? Uh, although INO was fully funded in 2015, we've been having difficulties with clearances. So the actual construction of the, of, of the lab has been stalled for the last few years, but uh, a lot of, uh, a uh, lot of detector R&D has gone on, starting out, this is a very old slide, more than uh, 14 years old, starting from the small one meter by one meter RPCs and the test stands, characterizing these RPCs, going to two meter by two meter and the current uh, manufacture of RPCs by industry, so that technology transfer has already happened. Uh, then uh, we come to the, uh, to the electronics, starting out from very simple electronics, now moving on to the state of the art electronics for front end, back end data acquisition, et cetera. So I think I would, it would be fair to say that we are now completely ready to actually, uh, all the components are ready to be transferred to industry. This is our mini ICAL 85 ton at, uh, at Madurai in South India. Well, we are in South India, further south of India, <laughs> sorry. So uh, with 11 layers of iron with the RPCs, which you can't see. And here you can finally see the copper uh, here, this and this, uh, which, uh, which uh, gives you the magnetic field of 1.5 Tesla as required. And a lot of students have worked on this. It has been running through the pandemic. Uh, here are some summer students from uh, local colleges. And this is something I really want to highlight that I think that such an experiment will really be a boon for students. I think they just cannot overstate the case. Here are some, these were the first, uh, first results from, you can see the, the bending of these uh, uh, first uh, events from there uh, that has been characterized now and have actually got the cosmic ray muon flux uh, and compared with Corsica up to 3 GV, which matches so well. So in fact, we are very confident now. So it has, it's very important for not only testing your simulations, but also you're testing your Kalman filter simulations uh, uh, and other things. Uh, so the other proposal that is there is a cosmic uh, muon veto detector, which I don't want to spend time on because I don't have the time, but it's also a very interesting uh, proposal. So I, I want to spend two minutes on something that is uh, very close to my heart. I think this is about uh, outreach for INO, not just INO. I think many current and future proposed mega science projects are there. I think you will hear about some, some more of them in the session. Uh, maybe in the afternoon, and uh, some like I know are completely indigenous. These experiments are going to probe some of the most important frontiers of physics, astrophysics. And I think that we have to be very aware of the fact that we have to bring these innovations and ideas to the notice of the public because there is a certain gap, I think, between the understanding and awareness uh, of, of the general public, not so much as students. Uh, and uh, they ha that has, I think, been the cause of many of our uh, clearances being delayed. So, I mean, the outreach or what is the T equal to zero start time of the experiment, I think is the same. So uh, there are different kinds of audiences. And I think that I would like to say for the benefit of others who might want to actually have a mega science project in India, some things that we have learned along the line is that students have always been enthused by our talks. I've always had students come up to me and ask, when can I join INO? When is it going to start? So that's not going to be a problem. I think that if we are really keen on this project, manpower is not, manpower, human, human resources, sorry, is not going to be a problem. But uh, uh, there are uh, other groups of people who have to be answered to, because I think when you have public funding, it is our duty to actually answer these questions and to try to convince people and especially environmental activists have asked many, many detailed questions regarding the lab construction and the nature of neutrinos. And I have forgotten to put over here, we have many, many uh, documents 
available on the INO website on all these issues. We have tried to answer from, you know, can our goats graze on your land up to how, what will happen to the dam 40 kilometers away when you start drilling. So we have answers to all these questions. I think they have to be taken very seriously. The bureaucracy has to be convinced that, you know, it's, this is a project which has no commercial enterprise and cannot employ people on very in very large numbers. But the importance of doing this and its applications to society in many considerations, I, we have to seriously address this issue, can be addressed. Of course, journalists, thankfully or otherwise, media attention is short-lived, but you have to be prepared to answer questions at a moment's notice. Uh, and of course, general audience, I think we have to actually tell them, because in my next slide, I actually hi highlight more about this, that uh, basic science, at least in India is considered exotic, whereas technology, mobiles, TVs, cars are accepted without blinking an eyelid. So this uh, science and scientists are looked on with suspicion. Uh, I don't know whether it is, uh, what is the history behind it, but certainly I think we have not done enough work to tell people more about our, our work and, and the implications of our work. We have stayed in our ivory towers and we are, it's very important for us to to dispel these doubts, for example, many things that have convinced people that I personally have used, discovered the electron 100 years ago, simply driven by curiosity. But you know, today we have electronics and computers because of this discovery. Same way positron was discovered, today we have PET scans, medical imaging, etc. Everyone uses Swiggy and, uh, and uh, uh, Ola for, for their food and their, their transport, but uh, time on the GPS clock will be off by 30 mi 38 microseconds per day, 45 due to general relativity, minus seven due to special relativity. If you don't make corrections for this, you will not get your Swiggy, your neighbor will get it instead. Uh, computers, of course, quantum computing, uh, knowledge of maths, which allows you to put your James Webb Space Telescope at the Lagrange point. All these, I think, are points where you have to convince people that I think science is relevant for society. I think without this, you will not get the project. But in conclusion, I would like to say, that we have a proof of principle of all the components of ICAL already available. Uh, Mini ICAL has preliminary results on the cosmic muon flux at low energy. We have a lot of interaction already with local industry. Uh, we have a plan to build a, a, a 120th scale module, 800 ton uh, engineering prototype, most likely in Calcutta. Uh, in addition, we have proven the value of the greatly successful INO graduate program. And I think this highlights the importance of a homegrown experiment where people, students can come and hands-on work on the detector and see how it works. We are still waiting for these clearances, which are proving hard to get. Uh, I think in spite of these delays, we believe that the physics reach will be complementary and still uh, uh, appropriate in, uh, with respect to current and future proposed detectors. There are many other future exciting possibilities. There will be more in the next talk by Vivek. So I think you can hear how many ideas we have. And I do believe that INO will galvanize science across the country by offering opportunities to students and industry to work in the cutting edge atmosphere. So, and this would not have been possible, as I said, without students and other collaborators. Thank you very much. Thanks, Indu. <laughs> Thanks for enlightening yeah. others about the Indian <laughs> yes. physics. Yeah. Not this the, court, now uh, the floor yeah, is open yeah, to question yeah. and comment. Rohini. Yeah. Wanted to ask you one yeah. question. Yeah. You showed synergy with other experiments. Uh, what about Juno? Juno is a very different experiment because Juno is looking, see, if you look at the sine squared term, you know, delta into L by E. So if you, you can think of delta as a Fourier transform of L over E. So there is an L, L delta of 3, 1 and delta of 3, 2. And the little difference between them is like the beats that you will get. That's really what Juno is looking at. So it's a, it's a very different approach. But the thing is that if Juno doesn't get their 3% resolution, for example, if it is 5%, they will not see, uh, I mean, it's not as though they will be able to look at the hierarchy by integrating 10 years data, no. How many ever years of experiment, so, so, if they don't so get resolution that, is the key resolution is the key for Juno. So yes. That's why you have not uh, uh, really directly compared. No, 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 no. Because see, Juno is coming up. Juno is I under know. construction, no, will come up. That's exactly why yes, I asked you yes, this. Yes, because yes, yes. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, will, yeah. They are, they are always on time. Even though they have COVID shut down, they don't seem to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Maybe I should have made a mention of it. Yeah, yeah. Hi, okay. Yeah, I can hear. You. It's a great talk. Uh, so, I know it's taken. You guys have been at it for a long time. Yes, two, three decades. But how are you funding the students? We have funding till twenty twenty three for training. <laughs> no, we, yes, we have. Yes, for, for fun, we have funding for, for the project till twenty twenty three. And of course, we are in the business of trying to get that extension. Oh, yeah, okay. so yeah. It, it also supports the detector R and D. 
that no, no, ask the boss. The boss will clarify this. That's also a component is included in that project. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we do have a few students left over. We have not taken new students in the last three years. That's not because of COVID. Because, I mean, everyone is worried about what happens after 2023 if the project doesn't get extended. Then the students will will have to face the problem. So, but. I, I am very positive that we will get this project extended. We will. We have struggled long enough. It has to come. <laughs> you cannot give up. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in one of your slides, you were showing about the the efficiency for the track reconstruction, and so I think you talked about something like eighty percent. So I was just wondering, what is the main contributor for your inefficiency there? Oh, this okay. So slide. I I don't need to show that for right. for this. So the 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 thing is when when we say efficiency. Uh, you see, we have 5.6 centimeter iron plates, right? And we have nanosecond uh, resolution RPCs. So it is very important for us to know up versus down because the matter effect is different between up and down, right? So you have, you have this particle going at 30 centimeters per nanosecond. So you need to have the particle going through at least four or five layers before you can actually make this up-down discrimination. And if it's going more horizontally, then of course, even higher energy particles will not go through that many layers. That is why the, the efficiency drops as a function of the angle also. So you mean the, the just orientation of the track? Yeah, that, one is orientation is of the track and the other is, as I said, you have minimum number of events because but, you know you I have- think, I think I saw the, the plot, I think it's slide 23. <laughs> Sorry, there are so many even, slides that it will slowly go. Okay, one simple answer is that is mainly because of the multiple scattering. This is the now a 5.6 ah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No bother. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Uh, in the, Where are you? Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, talk, uh, talk, talk. Thank you. Uh, but I think you in your outreach, you uh, have missed the most important outreach program that you should have. You have there? to convince those dishonest politicians. That is not outreach. That, that is called outreach. politics. <laughs> Sorry, but I have very strong views on that. I'm serious, okay? I'm very serious about that. I don't think that outreach will convince the, the politicians. The, the, the delay of the delay of the I know is nothing to do with any of those outreach programs we have failed. It is only because of the politicians are playing politics. Yes. Yeah, so I have a physics question, not the politics. Um, yes. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Ha, ha, yeah, right. yeah. So uh, that the fact is given the you know the problem with the the South India uh, huh. part. Um, so have you considered like Plan B and Plan C of different venue? And with that, how is your physics sensitivity, the main physics school that you have, uh, you know, sort of how they kind of. Uh, so sort of depend on the, on the on the venue side. I mean, because you, you need to be prepared if you... We have looked at seven alternate sites. I have looked at seven alternate sites. But the thing is that, no, it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg again, like we heard about the ILC, right? Uh, I think we, ha we have to try to convince uh, our funding authorities that it will not work out in Tamil Nadu and therefore they have to give us permission to go to the alternate sites. And as we have more time, we are finding better and better alternate sites. That is not the difficulty. But this, this transition to the new site has to happen in, in a certain fashion, which is taking its own time. But as I said, I am very hopeful that we will be able to actually build this detector in India. So maybe the next speaker will have to say something about it. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, one can just say that remaining questions may be addressed to the spokesperson of INO. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, just for those who do not know, the spokesperson of INO is actually the moderator of the session. So you can address all questions to him. <laughs> okay. okay, thank you very much. Then we'll stop here. Thanks, and thanks all the speakers in the morning sessions and we'll break and after the lunch, we'll again convince here at uh, 1.50.